baptism, but there's many feelings. How many of you read the book of Acts? How the individuals that was there on the day of Pentecost were filled again and again for the anointing to come upon them. Not that we lose the Holy Spirit, but we need a fresh touch. We need a fresh welcoming of the Holy Spirit. Lift your hands, open your hearts. Let's pray that together. Holy Spirit, fall on us, fill us. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Your presence is so valuable to us. We reverence you, Holy Spirit, on this Pentecost Sunday when we commemorate that day of Pentecost. We've had our personal Pentecost. But Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can have a fresh in feeling fresh encounter. We ask that you do something in us. Turn us inside out. Oh yes. Turn us inside out. Oh Lord, that we'll reflect you in a greater way, a greater measure. Lord, a world in crisis needs a church in revival. We pray, Lord, for our nation this morning. In the name of Jesus, this chaos that we're seeing throughout our land is not of you, it's of the devil. And we lift up to you, make us available, set us on fire, that we can go into our world and shine the love of the Lord Jesus Christ and the power of the gospel. This is the only thing that will help us, Lord. We pray that every root of racism and prejudice would be burned out of us as we are filled with the Holy Spirit as your church. If there's any such thing in us, Lord, we need you. We thank you. We welcome you. Just uh, thank you for the joy. You know, the Bible says, church, that the disciples, this is like in Acts 13, to talk about those continual feelings in the church was filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. How many of you would raise your hand and say, Pastor, I could use a little more joy today. I know that you, I can too. Father, just lift your hands and just rejoice in Him. Hallelujah. That's how the joy is manifested. Hallelujah. Thank you for that joy that's constant, Lord. Thank you for rejoicing and praise. We bless you. We honor you. Oh, God's so good to us. It's so good to see you. Wow. You're looking good, looking better this Sunday in the second service than you did last Sunday. You're looking good to at home, congregation, online. We sure had a wave at some folks. Wave at some folks. There's some up in the balcony. Let them know that you're glad to see them. Wow. How great is this? How good is this? Thank you. Thank you. Hey, uh, just want to give you an update. I was on a Zoom call this past Thursday morning. We needed to get back together as the state council and the district overseers across our state. We needed an update. Where are we with this thing called COVID-19 and physical distancing and all of that? And so we have some recommendations. Uh, it's not a cookie cutter. Different churches have different situations. And then, as you know, the governor came out Thursday afternoon after we had our Zoom call. And he came out with extending the state of emergency until July the 13th, uh, July the 12th, excuse me. And now he's lifted some restrictions in some areas. And uh, having said that, and what we've just realized from Thursday, I'm going to be meeting with our uh, COVID-19 task force, our team here, uh, tonight at six o'clock, we'll meet in the in, in the uh, Smith Center. We'll social distance, and there's about ten of us, and we'll meet and we will lay out a strategy. And first thing in the morning, we will start getting this information out to you. Whatever changes we can make here, we know the governor did lift some restrictions uh, that would apply to churches. And we're going to talk about that this evening, but we'll get that out by letter. We'll get out that out by Facebook. So. Uh, just stay tuned, and uh, as we've said all along, this is a very fluid situation. So we're just having to, uh, we're just having to adapt sometimes quickly. And uh, but you've been so gracious, you've been so supportive, and I just want you to know how much I appreciate you. As always, as you leave right now, we're not passing golf room plates. We're trying to really be good in the social distancing, but you can give your time and offering as you leave. 
Uh, those of you that are walking, uh, uh, watching by uh, live stream at home, you'll see the graphic come up and you can give a line or you can mail the uh, contribution in to your church. And we so appreciate, so appreciate this. You have just blessed the kingdom with your faithfulness to God. I've said it in every service. We've just been amazed how that you have given more through these 10 to 11 weeks than you were giving before. And you were already a great tithing and giving church. Can we give God praise for that? If I read my Bible correctly in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, there is a grace of giving. Did you know that? God will give us a grace for giving. And I pray that over you. And, and thank you for uh, allowing that gift of giving just to flow through you and you're blessing the kingdom. We're blessing others. We sure are because of your faithfulness. God bless you. Turn your attention to the screen and let's uh, observe our video announcements. Welcome home, church family. It is so nice to have you back in worship with us today. Let's take a few minutes and just see what's on the schedule for the upcoming week. South Georgia camp meeting will be a little different this year. Rewind will be June 1st through June 7th. Morning and evening services. All services can be watched on Facebook Live or live stream at sgacog.org. We will be celebrating our high school and college graduates on Sunday, June the 14th. We will have gift tables set up for our high school graduates, Zach McCrory and Muriel Hayes. I hope that each and every one of you will come and help us celebrate their success. We are so grateful for your financial support these past few weeks. Since some of our church family can't be with us, tithes and offerings can still be given through our online giving at vitalitychurch.org, mailing, 401 Badger Street, or just come by the office. In your prayer time this week, remember the ones on our prayer list that God's healing hands will touch and it's only He can. You can stay up to date with all of our church events by following our social media platforms. Well, those are the announcements for the week, but we want you to know, if you need us, just give Pastor Merritt or the staff a call. On this Pentecost Sunday, I want to minister a message that I've entitled, Why We Need the Holy Spirit. The, uh, the monitors are a little hot up here. If you want to just take them down just a little bit for me, that'll be probably be good. I might start ringing here when I get loud in a minute. But why we need the Holy Spirit? The Methodist missionary, E. Stanley Jones, had a great impact this past century, the 20th century, on the nation of India. Matter of fact, there were several times in his life that he ministered personally to Gandhi. He made a profound statement once about the necessity of the Holy Spirit in our lives. He said that Pentecost is not a spiritual luxury. It is an utter necessity for human living. The human spirit fails unless the Holy Spirit fails. It's Pentecost or failure. This was not talking about a denomination. This was talking about the gift of the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit in each of our lives and ministries and the necessity of Him for us to be who God has made us to be, created us to be, and to do what God has created us to do. If you want to see just how necessary the Holy Spirit is in our lives and how much we need Him, look with me in the book of Acts chapter 1 verses 4 and 5, because Jesus has risen from the dead. He's in this 40-day period between His resurrection and His ascension. And these disciples had spent three and a half years with Him, and they've seen Him die on the cross, and, and even though that was very traumatic for them, they came back around to believe and put their faith in Him after that He was raised from the dead. But notice, even yet, these that had been with Him for three and a half years, he has told them he is going away. And this is what he says in Acts uh, chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. On one occasion, while he, Jesus, was eating with them, the disciples, he gave them this command. Everybody say command. I'm talking about the necessity of the Holy Spirit in our lives. This is the command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait. 
for the gift of the Father that my Father has promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John truly baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. We know that in just a few days after Jesus made this statement, he ascended back to heaven. In 10 days, as a matter of fact, after he ascended back to heaven, it was the Feast of Shavuot. And that feast was what we call Pentecost. It's also called the Feast of Weeks. It completed the seven-week period between the Feast of the First Fruits at Passover and the completion of the harvest. Sometimes it's referred to as the Feast of Harvest. And they would come back to Jerusalem on this Sunday. It was seven weeks, 49 days plus one. And they would come back on the first day of the week into the city of Jerusalem as one of the three major feasts throughout the year that every Jew was required to come back for. And it's in this setting that they are there. They're there from all over the world on this particular Sunday. The Bible says... The Holy Spirit came in a new found way. The Holy Spirit had always been here. Just look at Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. And He was hovering over the water. He was in the creation. We know that the Holy Spirit came upon priests. And the Holy Spirit came upon prophets. And the Holy Spirit came upon special individuals and servants like uh, kings. He filled John the Baptist even from his mother's womb. And we know that Jesus himself has a testimony to us all when he was baptized in water that the Holy Spirit filled him like a dove came upon him signifying the anointing of his earthly ministry that, that started at that very moment for the next three and a half years. But here's the point. The Old Testament prophets had prophesied the Holy Spirit is coming in a newfound way. He's not going to be just for select people anymore. He is going to come upon every gender, every ethnicity and race, every generation. The Bible says that uh, when the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2 verse 1, had fully come, that all these 120 disciples were in one place together. And suddenly, we need some suddenlies in our lives sometimes. We need God to move now, and He does. And suddenly, there was a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them divided tongues, like as a fire, like the flames of fire, flames of tongues. And that one of those flames set upon each of those 120. They could see the visible manifestation of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues as the Spirit enabled them or gave them the utterance, the old King James says. And the Bible says that when these disciples went out into the street, they were magnifying God in these foreign languages, languages they had never learned. The crowd that was there from all over the world, they heard them in their own language uh, magnify God in their language. They knew they were Galileans. They knew that they didn't speak multiple languages, but they were magnifying God in these Holy Spirit inspired tongues. And they, they thought they were drunk at one point. And, and they said, what does this mean? What does this mean? And Peter steps up full of the Holy Spirit. And he said, we're not drunk as you think we are. It's just nine o'clock in the morning. But this is that that was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he quotes the prophet Joel from Joel chapter two. And he said, this is what Joel said. This is the fulfillment of it. In the last days, watch this. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh all flesh and your sons and your daughters every generation shall prophesy did you hear daughters in there and, and it's you know that's the gift of the Holy Spirit the prophecy whether it's in tongues and interpretation of tongues Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14 or it's a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams and upon my servants and my handmaidens in those days I will pour out my spirit says the Lord and cutting it to the very chase and we can see 
say that, not that the other scriptures are not important. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. Amen. Oh, the church was formed. The Holy Spirit came in and you found a way. No longer did you have to be a certain person, office. Everybody was in dwelled with the Holy Spirit that called on the name of the Lord. That believed and trusted in Him. You see, you and I cannot, as John said, we cannot live this human life, this human experience without the Holy Spirit. You can't even talk about the Christian life without talking about the Holy Spirit. Some 261 times in the New Testament along the person of the Holy Spirit, the ministry of the Holy Spirit is, is mentioned just in the New Testament. You know, the Bible says this is how integral He is to our lives, that we are born of the Spirit of God. The Bible says that uh, we bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says we are to live in the Spirit or walk in the Spirit. <clears throat> the Bible says that we can be filled with the Spirit, we're to be baptized in the Spirit, that we're to be strengthened in the Spirit. The Bible says that we're to pray in the Spirit. The Bible says we are led by the Spirit. How many of you believe that we need the Holy Spirit in our lives? Amen. And that's the point of the message. That's the point of the Bible. And what we understand is that we need the Holy Spirit in our lives. And I want to unpack this this morning because I think both non-believers and believers alike, sometimes we just misunderstand the Holy Spirit. And I have done this a while in my life, and if I can help you, and I don't want to just instruct this morning, but I tell you what, I don't know about you, but I need a fresh and feeling in my life. I need an encouragement from the Holy Spirit in my life, and I believe the Holy Spirit is here to do that for us today. But you know, so many times, people have such a misunderstanding of the Holy Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit is not weird, folks. Sometimes people do weird things, and they blame it on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit didn't have anything to do with it. You know, we are emotional beings, but the Holy Spirit is more than a, an emotional response. Let me say very quickly, did you know that God has emotions? He is angry. He is joyful. He sings over us. He dances over us. Zephaniah 3. Yes, the Holy Spirit has emotions. That's not what I'm saying. But many times we don't, we, we, we are so moved in our own emotions that it's our emotions and that's okay. I mean, you were with Peter and John healed the lame man at the temple gate. He just got up and started jumping around. Well, the man had been crippled for 38 years. Who would get up and jump around, right? But what I'm saying is, if we're not talking about this kind of thing, so many times we, we, Pack the Holy Spirit is some kind of impersonal force. He's not an it. He's not a psychic phenomenon. Here's who he is. The Holy Spirit is the third person, we say, in the triune God. One God, eternally existing in three persons. He is co-equal. He is co-eternal. He is co-existent with God the Father and God the the Son. And here's, here's how I like to use my own definition here to explain how much I need the Holy Spirit in my own life. Here's how I understand Him. The Holy Spirit is a person with whom I have a personal relationship who gives to me many life-changing and eternal experiences. Salvation is an experience. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is an experience. If He uses anyone in my life or uses me in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, there are many experiences that He brings. He's more than an experience. He's a person. And the point is, I just want to lift up some things for us this morning that helps us love Him and welcome Him and reverence Him and enjoy Him more in our lives. And the first, I'm just going to give you two major headings this morning, two major points, and I'll work from those. But the first reason we need the Holy Spirit in our lives is because we need His presence. We need the presence of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives, involved in our lives. If you have not put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you can't even be saved without the Holy Spirit's presence. If you are watching and you don't know Jesus, 
Every time you hear a message and our suffering witnesses to you, that drawing, that pulling you to, uh, that, that feeling inside of you, that inner voice, that's the Holy Spirit working on your conscience, drawing you. See, there's a difference between conviction and condemnation. The Holy Spirit never condemns. Jesus said in John 3, 16, you know, God so loved the world, but then he said in verse 17, what? For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world would believe on him and be saved. Those that don't believe on me are condemned already. But when I talk about conviction, what I'm talking about is the Holy Spirit is drawing us to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a, there's a, a brokenness that sometimes we sense, or there's a convincing that Jesus Christ died for us on the cross, that He is the Savior, that He is the Messiah, that He did take all of my guilt and shame, and all I've got to do is turn my life over to Him, and He will save me. He will free me from guilt. He will fill me with peace. He will fill me with joy in my heart if I will trust Him. Jesus said this to his disciples. Now, Jesus, on the night before he went to the cross in the upper room, in John, we call it the upper room discourse, John 14, John chapter 15, and John chapter 16, he spent a lot of time telling his disciples about the Holy Spirit. That's why in our text he said, you heard me speak about him. And he spent a, a, an extreme amount of time in those three chapters, at least you can see just how often that he spoke to them about the Holy Spirit. But this is what he said in John 16 and 7. He said to his disciples, it is to your advantage that I go away. Because if I do not go away, the Holy Spirit will not come. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Jesus, how many of you believe he's the God-man? How many of you believe there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus? How many of you believe that there's a man sitting at the right hand of God with the marks of humanity in his hand? He is the glorified Savior of the world, bearing our marks for eternity. Hallelujah. He's our mediator. He's our advocate. Glory to God. And what you and I know is that he's there and he's coming back again. But until that day, he said, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave you. They were all filled with trepidation that the disciples were. He said, but hey, listen, if I depart, I will send him to you. And then this is what he said. He said, when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And that's the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives, working in our conversion is the work of the Holy Spirit. That's what I want you to see. That His presence is at work in us in conversion. That's the whole discussion with Nicodemus in John 3. He's a part of the leadership. He's part of the Sanhedrin. And he came to Jesus one night. And he said, we know that you are from God. Because nobody can do these miracles that you're doing unless God was with him. And Jesus just cut to the chase and he said, you must be born again. Nicodemus said, now how can this happen? I'm, I'm a teacher in Israel, but I don't understand this. Can a man, when he is old, enter his mother's womb again and be born? Jesus said, no. Unless you enter the kingdom of God, being born of spirit, you cannot enter that kingdom. Because flesh gives birth to flesh, and spirit gives birth to spirit. Here's the point. Even the sinner person, thank God for the presence of the Holy Spirit. When, when you just sense Him drawing you to change your life, you can't do that on your own. You see, it's the miracle power of the Holy Spirit. And then once He draws you to Christ and you say yes to Christ in faith, it's the Holy Spirit's presence that does that miraculous work in you. You can't join enough churches to be saved. You can't be baptized enough to be saved. You can't take Holy Communion enough to be saved. You can't get moral enough to be saved. That's the work, the supernatural work. And I want to tell you, the greatest miracles I said to you a few weeks ago, the greatest miracle in all the world is that miracle of salvation because we can't save ourselves. And the Bible says very succinctly to us in Titus 3 and 5, it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but it's 
according to his mercy that he saves us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes when we say yes to Christ and he makes us a new creation. All things have passed away and all things have become new. And at that moment, the Holy Spirit dwells in your heart. Romans 8 and 9 simply says this, that the Holy Spirit dwells within us because of the very fact that you and I, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Yeah, I've talked to Christians before. I've talked to certain groups of Christians before. They don't, they don't understand that, but immediately we talk about, I know we tell children that this is true for us as adults. That when we receive Jesus, he comes into our heart, all right? You remember the little girl? She was about five years old. She was ill. She went to, she went to her doctor. And she was so scared. She didn't say anything. And the doctor saw that. And he's trying to help her feel not so worried. And he takes the otoscope and he looks in her ear. And he said, you think I'll find Big Bird in your ear? And she didn't say a word. And then he took that cone depressor, the thing we hate. And he said, say, ah. Oh. And she's so scared. And he said, you think I'll find Cookie Monster down there? And she didn't say a word. Then he took the stethoscope, put it on her little chest. But Hear her breathe. And he said, you think I'll find Barney in your heart? She said, no, sir. Jesus is in my heart. Barney's on my underpants. <laughs> but Jesus is in your heart. And we need his not only presence in, uh, in conversion. We need his presence. We need to commune with him. And, and as I have asked the Lord to prepare me this week for you, I, I'll tell you, I just got a renewed hunger of the Holy Spirit presence in my own heart, in my own mind, and in my own life. And there's a powerful scripture here. And I want you to see it. I, I'm going to put this one on the screen. I want you to see this because it's in John's Gospel, chapter 14 and verse 16. And Jesus is beginning on this night before he goes to the cross to really reveal to them who's coming, who they're going to receive on this day of Pentecost. And he said, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor. Your translation, the old King James, comforter or helper. The new King James are all capitalized. Talking about the Holy Spirit. He will give you another counselor to be with you forever. The Spirit of truth, he says. By the way, when you're referring to the Holy Spirit, please capitalize those. He's a person. He's the, that, that's his name. And... Um, and, and let's capitalize him. It, it, my spirit is a little S, but he's a big S. Amen? And, and he says, uh, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And I love that. Because it tells me that he's going to be with me forever. It tells me that in my loneliness... And they're saying there's a lot of people going through this COVID-19, this sheltering in place. There's a lot of people that are going through aloneness. There's a lot of people going through loneliness, we say. And it's an emotion that probably all of us maybe have felt at one point in our life. But I want you to be reminded that while we need each other, you have a counselor inside of you. The Holy Spirit. Look at Him this way. He is your intimate friend. Have communion with Him. Speak with him. What Jesus is simply saying is, yes, I'm leaving you physically. I'm going to go away. But the same person that was with you physically, though he is the Holy Spirit, he is coming to you to continue what I started. Now, here's the thing. We believe in the Trinity. But he says another. That word is allos in the Greek. And it means another of the same kind. It's a different word for another than you typically read. In other words, yes, we know that it's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But just as you experience me physically, you're going to experience the Holy Spirit spiritually in your heart. How many of you have ever said, boy, I would have loved to have been with Jesus while he was here on uh, those three and a half years. And, and, uh, and we would have really liked to have done that and gone through what we think he went through. How many of us many times, well, I want to be alive when Jesus comes back. I do. I really do. 
But I want to tell you, the Holy Spirit is here just as real. And He is your counselor. Think about this. When, when you need, the, the word here is paraclete, and it's one alongside to help you. In some translations, it's advocate. And think of the Holy Spirit this way. You've got your own personal defense attorney inside of you. Every time the enemy accuses you of your past, accuses me of my past, I want to tell you, you've got a defense attorney. He's the advocate, the NIV says. He is our advocate. And I want to tell you, the Bible says in Romans 8 and 26, we don't always know how we should pray as we ought to pray, but the Holy Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. And he who searches the minds knows what is the mind. He who searches the heart knows what is the mind of the Holy Spirit, for he makes intercession for the saints, that's you and me, according to the will of God. Can somebody thank God the Comforter has come? The Counselor is here. He is inside of you, and you can have communion with Him in your life. He's the advocate. Jesus said in John 14 and 26 that you would have a personal teacher. When he has come, he will teach you all things. And John chapter, John chapter 14, 26, he said that. John chapter 15 and 26, he said when he has come, he will testify of me. In John chapter uh, 16 and verse 13, he will guide you. I'm talking about communion, folks. The Bible says in John 16 and 14 that he will glorify me when he has come. When I was a little boy growing up at the Ridgeford Church, I bet you sung it here too, if you've been in this church from 30, 40 years ago. Now, I love the new courses. I've always been able to move along with the current music. It doesn't bother me a bit. Now, it takes me a little while to get used to it, but once I do, I love it. <laughs> Took me a little while to get used to Toby Mac, but I like him. <laughs> great, great guy, great singer, great worshiper. But how many of you remember singing when you were young in church? He abides. He abides. Anybody? Yes. Hallelujah. He abides with me. I'm rejoicing night and day as I walk the narrow way. For the comforter abides with me. And so he does. Here's a great benediction. We call it in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. This is it. Listen to it. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, watch this, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you always. Be with you all. And here's the point. That word communion is koinonia from the Greek, and it means fellowship. That word means partnership. You've got a partner for life in your life. Amen? So that's the presence. We need the Holy Spirit because of His presence in conversion. We need the Holy Spirit. We need His presence to, com to be in communion, to guide us and lead us and teach us and to fellowship with us and to strengthen us. But then we need His power. We need the Holy Spirit because we need the power of the Holy Spirit. The prophet Zechariah chapter 4 verse 6 says, It's not by might nor by power, but it's by my Spirit says the Lord. I just want to say, this world is in a crisis. We know that. If you've watched any news the last week, and this has been a tough year. And we've gone through this pandemic, and then on top of that, we're seeing this kind of chaos, and we're seeing what perhaps was racism and prejudice, and we, we deplore that in our hearts. And then on the other hand, you see a, a worldly chaos. And as I said earlier, chaos is always of the devil. Chaos is always of the devil. What this world needs is a church and a Christian that's empowered with the Holy Spirit to love and to give love. And that's who you, you and I are in our lives. And I just want to lift up. These, these are going to be kind of quick. But they're bam, bam, boom. And it, it, here they are. First of all, we need the power of God for inner transformation in our lives. Inner transformation. You know, the preacher can't transform you. Your spouse can't transform you. I remember 
hearing a member of my church say to me one time, I was a young whippersnapper and preaching, she was an older saint, she said, now Brother Mary, you can't make us live right. I know that's right. I realized I couldn't even make Wayne live right. <laughs> one pastor became an undertaker and he said, I used to try to straighten people out when I was a pastor. And uh, he said, now, he said, when I straighten them out, they stay straight. <laughs> but you know, it's that inner transformation that we need in our lives. Turn with me in your Bibles. And this is the only time I'll ask you to do this. And I should have put this on the screen because I want you to see it, whatever translation you have. I'll read it from the NIV. But 2 Corinthians chapter 3, the second letter of Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. I want you to see this, how that, that we need the power of the Holy Spirit. We can't transform ourselves. We can't. We can't grow to be like Jesus. We, it's maturity before ministry. We talk about the power of the Holy Spirit, but we got to, first of all, talk about the power of maturity, those fruit of the Holy Spirit, right? And this is what it says in 2 Corinthians 3, 17. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. What's verse 18? And we who with unveiled faces all reflect all. Everybody say all. All reflect the Lord's glory. Do you look at your spouse or your neighbor or your friend, whoever you're sitting by, and say, I see a little bit of Jesus in you. Can you do that? I see a little bit of Jesus. Maybe you see a lot of Jesus. But he's not through. The scripture's not through. He continues. We are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing Glory. Now look at your spouse or your neighbor and say, I need to see a lot more Jesus in you. <laughs> you know, we call it born again for a reason. We got to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord. And I got a lot of old Wayne in me, and he's going to hang around until I go to, Jesus, go to be with Jesus and I'm going to get a glorified body. How many of you know that's right? It's a process in our lives. And he, he says that with every increase in glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And only the Holy Spirit, only He can cause us to reflect like the Lord and work on us with that old nature, that stuff that we brought with us into this new life. It's a process of transformation with ever increasing glory. Hey, I heard about a fifth grader who was asked to write a paper on Quakers, and uh, he said, uh, Quakers are very mild, meek, tempered people that don't raise their voice nor act out of anger. He said, my father is a Quaker. My mother is something else. <laughs> well, you got Jesus in you, but you got something else too. You got that old person that hangs around that he's working on and he's maturing and he's developing and he's helping us to be more and more like him. Speaking of the Quakers, I heard of the old Quaker that bought a dairy cow that was very obstinate. And the Quaker, every time he would start milking the cow, he'd get about halfway through and the cow would kick over the bucket. He'd go back, sit on the bucket, start milking again, the cow would kick over the bucket. One day he got really, really frustrated. He for a Quaker. He got in the cow's face and he said, Madam Cow, if you turn that bucket over one more time, I cannot curse thee. I cannot